So I'm going to go ahead and start with the introductions while uh, people are, are walking in and taking their seats. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us once again uh, to the Fall 2021 DeFord Lecture Series. Um, in just a minute, we're very happy to have Marissa Belusis joining us this afternoon. In just a minute, Todd is going to introduce her. Um, just a couple quick words about the DeFord Lecture Series. Um, this used to be technical sessions, and it has been since the 1940s a uh, tradition in the Department of Geological Sciences to have uh, this venue for uh, students and faculty and distinguished visitors to present uh, the results of their research to members of our community. Um, and the DeFord Lecture Series is named after Ronald DeFord, who was a member of the department for many years. He joined the department in 1948 as a professor, uh, and he was graduate advisor in the department from 1949 to 1967, quite a long time supervised a phenomenal 19 PhD dissertations and 126 master's theses. Uh, and one of his real contributions to the department was uh, managing um, the, uh, what was a graduate course at the time called technical sessions uh, and providing an opportunity for, for students to present their research. And so a few years ago in, in, in honor of his contributions to the department, the DeFord Lecture Series was renamed in his honor. And I am very happy that we have uh, 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 Marissa Pelusis from the uh, Dartmouth University joining us this afternoon. And to tell us just a little bit about Marissa, what she's gonna be talking to us about, uh, I'll turn things over to Todd Houch. Yep, yeah, Tim, Tim Gouch, all right. Um, so I'll, um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Marissa Pelusis, who's presently uh, an assistant professor at Dartmouth College uh, in New Hampshire. Um, prior to Dartmouth, Marissa was a NSF postdoctoral fellow at Caltech, where she worked with Mike Lamb. Um, before that, she did her PhD at UC Berk Berkeley, working with Bill Dietrich, and a, and a BSc in, in chemical engineering and math, actually, at University of South Carolina. Um, Broadly, Marissa's research sort of focuses on landscape evolution and sedimentary systems across uh, multiple planets, um, mostly focusing on Earth and Mars. Um, and Marissa's uh, actively involved in the AGU Earth and Planetary Surface Processes section. And um, I think her work really nicely typifies the sort of broad range of fundamental science in, in this AGU um, section. Um, and I'm always sort of impressed by the range of her science um, from studying everything, including ancient lake systems on Mars to running uh, physical flume experiments on gravel bedded rivers, or as she told me about today, um, uh, flume experiments on, on stromatolite formation, and then all the way to understanding alluvial fans in, in Arctic Canada, which is what we'll be hearing about um, today. So it's uh, really my pleasure to welcome Pro Professor Pelusis to the Jackson School, and we'll look forward to a great talk. So take it away, Marissa. Thank you. So thank you, Tim, for the very kind um, introduction. So yeah, my name is uh, Marissa and I am, I've had a really nice day talking to a number of you, um, faculty, students, and postdocs. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing um, with a number of collaborators in the Canadian Arctic. And we've basically been looking at a paraglacial alluvial fan system um, and the implications for understanding these similar features on Mars. Okay, I love starting with this slide um, just to show how different Earth and Mars are today. So Mars is about half the radius of Earth. It's further from the sun, uh, has a very thin atmosphere. The gravity is about one third of our own. Um, and the mean temperature is about minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So liquid water is very unstable on the surface of Mars today. But we know from orbital imagery, rover missions, that there are a number of superficial features um, that indicate that Mars was much more active, hydrologically active in the past, including looking at ancient crater lakes, valley networks, outflow channels, as well as alluvial fans. So alluvial fans, just the quickest primer, um, are basically formed when you have sediment and water coming through a steep canyon systems, such as this one in Death Valley. And then when you reach sort of an unconfined um, region, that flow will sp spread laterally and deposit sediment. And it creates this um, very beautiful fan-like shape. And 
We see these features across Mars. So this is an example of an alluvial fan in Harris Crater. So similar canyon, steep canyon that spreads out onto a crater floor. Now, the reason that we're fans of fans on Mars um, is that these features are ubiquitous across the equatorial region. Um, and so this is a, a map from uh, Alex Morgan and Sharon Wilson looking at everywhere where they've mapped fan deposits as well as potential um, deltaic deposits. And so in these regions in white are where we have sort of a, um, an unusually high concentration of these features. Now, the reason we're so interested in these features is that many of them have been dated to be young. Um, dating is, is not easy to do on Mars, but uh, many of these features formed in craters that we think were that we think formed within the Amazonian, which is sort of the most current um, era on Mars. Um, so looking at this sort of image over here, we have you know, four main sort of geologic periods. So I love Mars, it's only four. Um, so we have the pre-Noachian, um, which is very early Mars. We have the Noachian, which is where we think it may have been warmer and wetter than it was today. Um, as it started, the climate started to transition to being colder and drier. Um, that transitional period is the Hesperian and now sort of our, our more modern day conditions on Mars, this very cold and dry climate is that we call the, the Amazonian. And so um, if we sort of add up all the fans that formed um, in or formed within craters, many of those craters were formed within this um, most recent time period. And so basically this suggests that fans would have formed under very cold and dry uh, or paraglacial conditions. So understanding sort of water volumes and how much water was on the surface of Mars in the past has you know, huge implications. People are interested in this for a number of reasons, especially for thinking about past habitability of Mars. Um, and one of my interests is can we use alluvial fans or delta features to try and get at understanding what the hydrology and climate was in the past. The problem is, is that we actually don't have a lot of data on alluvial fan systems in general, and especially not in um, alluvial fan systems under paraglacial conditions. And so some of the key questions that we've been trying to answer in our work is, what are the dominant processes that build paraglacial fans? So are they typically built by high uh, rock to water debris flow events um, or more lower rock to water fluvial events? And so, these are two movies just kind of highlighting uh, the difference in what I mean by these sort of like rock to, rock to water ratios. Um, so in this first one, this is Sue, uh, was taken by Sue Cannon from the USGS. And this is a, a large debris flow event coming down. And you can just, you can see how much sediment is being transported relative to the amount of water. And these are fascinating flows. This boulder is like the size of a car, um, super cool. And this is in contrast when we have more traditional uh, bed load sediment transport. So this is a video taken from Staffel from the University of Minnesota. And you can see in these systems, there's a lot of water. So most of the, the space here is water, but bed uh, sediment is transporting along the bed as bed load. And so we wanna know sort of which of these processes dominate under paraglacial conditions. The second question is what the typical flow discharges, grain sizes, and sediment fluxes are on paraglacial fans and how this would compare to more temperate systems. So comparing this to alluvial fans that may have formed in say Death Valley or more temperate alluvial river systems. And then kind of, are there any features that we might see within the geomorphology or sedimentology at the scales that we have uh, data for on Mars? So whether that's from the orbital imagery or from uh, rover imagery that are really characteristic of icy processes. So that if we happen to, you know, bring a rover to an alluvial fan and we're looking at the sediments, um, can we say something about the climate? All right. So let me move this zoom bar. Um, so in selecting a field site, we had several criteria. So one is that we wanted the fan to be located within a continuous permafrost zone. Um, so all of these areas in purple, but we also wanted it to be accessible. Um, <coughs> we wanted the main source of water to the fan to be snowmelt. So most of the Martian literature has suggested that these fan systems would have been fed 
by snow melt from a melting snowpack. So we wanted to have that be the dominant sort of input of water. Um, and we wanted the fan and catchment area to be morphologically similar to Martian alluvial fan systems. So <coughs> um, we eventually settled on the looking at a, an alluvial fan that's coming off of the Richardson Mountains. Uh, the front portion of the Richardson Mountains is, is called the Aklavik Range, and this is located in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And it's in um, this continuous permafrost zone. Um, and this is just sort of showing, uh, you know, step back view of the field site. So this is the, we call this the Black Mountain Fan because there's a little peak here that's Black Mountain. Um, and you can see here the area outlined in red is the catchment. So this is where the water and sediment would be sourced. And then it's going to be deposited in this uh, cone fan shape. And this is just a sort of color image um, that I pulled from, I remember I pulled it from, probably Arc, Arc Pro, <laughs> showing the fan system. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things that intrigued us about this, these particular fans, um, so there's a number of fans, sort of a Bajada fans um, along this range, is that they seem to have similar scaling to Martian fans. So this is just one metric we looked at, which is the fan catchment area relative to the fan area. All of the terrestrial fans are mapped, um, the earth fans are mapped in blue. Uh, a number of Martian fans that we took from a paper from um, Moore and Howard, are mapped in red, and you can kind of see that the Aklavik fans are similar to Martian fans and that their fan area is tends to be larger for a given catchment area. Um, and part of the reason for that is likely the fact that there's not you know, traditional tectonics on Mars. So these are just forming into sort of stable crater basins, not these ex extensional basins that you might have in say like Death Valley. Okay, a little bit about our field site. So the climate is a semi-arid climate with cold and dry winters and short summers. <coughs> um, sorry. Uh, the mean temperature is about 12 degrees Celsius in June and minus 35 degrees Celsius in January. And the mean annual precipitation is about 200 to 250 millimeters with about 50% of that coming from snow. The geology of the site, the source material for the fan is Cretaceous in age, so about 113 to 133 MA. It's mostly shales, sandstones, um, and siltstones, and there are small amounts of sediment um, from the westward advance of the Laurentide ice sheet. The catchment itself is about four square kilometers in area. It has about a 450 meter high headwall, uh, and the fan is about 10 square kilometers in area. Um, this fan was actually mapped in the early 1990s, um, and it was suggested to be a debris flow dominated fan that had some paraglacial modification of the surface. So we went up and did our first uh, field, and only because of COVID, but first field campaign in 2019, in August of 2019. Um, and the goal was to basically go up there and document the geomorphic processes that we observed on the fan. Uh, and this is one of our, our collaborators. Um, to look at, sorry, uh, to look at the fan sedimentology, to take samples for getting at erosion and uplift rates, which I'm actually not going to talk about today, but um, kind of part of a continuing project at this site. Uh, we actually got to monitor active flow on this fan, which was super exciting for me, being somebody who spends a lot of time looking at ancient uh, fan systems on Mars and or fan systems in Death Valley. This is the first time I saw water flowing on an alluvial fan, and that was pretty cool. Um, and then as a geomorphologist, we always want as much uh, data as we can get on sort of the topography, the surface features. Uh, so we did a lot of uh, LIDAR scanning. So we used a terrestrial LIDAR scanner, um, as well as uh, drone imagery, and we used uh, photogrammetry to get topography from that imagery. OK, so what did we find? Um, <laughs> first, what were the dominant processes that, that seem to be building this particular fan? Um, so in looking at sort of the more modern day processes, um, we observed a small debris flow event that actually occurred off of, out of one of the gullies. Um, so here showing that there's this very, this sort of 40 to 90 meter thick sandstone unit um, with near vertical slopes that 
collects snow and also seems to concentrate water. Um, and then that water and snow that are being concentrated are flowing onto these sort of softer shales and onto these uh, talus slopes and in training material. And so they're also incising sort of uh, gully-like features. <laughs> and down slope of, of one of these um, gullies, we no observed a very small debris flow. So a lot smaller than the one that I showed you from the uh, Canon video, um, but has the classic characteristics of a debris flow. So you can see this very um, low bait snout. It was carrying material that was about maximum grain size, so probably about 20 centimeters or so. And you can see here that from this particular flow event, there's likely uh, two individual flows that came down. So this one would have come down first, followed by this, the second one. And you can also see these very baby levees that form. So debris flows will tend to push the coarser particles that they're transporting off to the sides and they get deposited into these um, levees that will sort of channelize the flow. Uh, we also observed a, a small debris flow event coming off of a what's likely a, um, a landslide. And so on one of the um, talus slopes, we observed sort of this head scarp. It's about a meter deep. And where the failure occurred, there seemed to be massive ice exposed. And then when you look down from the initiation zone, there's this channel that got, that got carved into this talus. Um, it's about one or so meters wide. And then there are a number of flow events that came through. Um, so at least two or three uh, flow events. And then when we were measuring it, you could see there's just sort of small amount of runoff from that um, ice that was melting. And then further down slope, um, this actually ran out pretty far, but you can see it's much finer grain than that other debris flow event. Um, <laughs> and some of the coarser material is getting uh, deposited. Um, this is probably from the second flow event. And then this is sort of the more fluvial um, activity happening after. Um, and then on the lower fan, we observed sort of, you know, more typical fluvial channels running across it. So this is one of the grad students that came, um, Emma Menio, and we were doing, I think, a pebble count at, at this site. Now, when we actually looked at the sedimentology, so when we looked at the upper fan, we observed that um, mainly these were debris flow deposits. So where we had good exposure, so in, in a number of these places where we have the um, black stars and where you can see in this sort of contour map, at the bottom right uh, of the screen, where you have the contours very close together. So this is the steep upper portion of the fan. Um, where we had good exposures, we, we observed that the class tended to be subangular to subrounded. Um, they're very poorly sorted in most cases. There was typically no imbrication or any sedimentary structures that we observed. Um, occasionally we observed reverse grading. So in cases where some of the larger particles would have, were sort of floating at the top of the deposit. Um, the largest class tended to be sandstones within these deposits, um, and a lot of the shale class uh, seemed to break down very quickly. So I have a couple of images showing that later on in the talk. Um, and the matrix composition, so the, the muddy kind of interstitial fluid that's able to transport these large class varied from a fine grain kind of clay matrix to a more sandy pebbly matrix. Um, no, we went onto the lower fan. It seemed to be more dominated by fluvial processes, which sort of makes sense based on what we saw from um, surf the surface. So we saw alternating layers of uh, silt and clay. Um, the silt did tend to be in some places more orange tinted. Um, the layering tended to be about five centimeters thick. The silt was often um, in individual lenses with imbricated pebbles. Um, and the lower fan deposits did tend to be overlain with about 0.5 to 0.75 meters of soil or, or tundra. Um, and as I mentioned, this is also where the channels were, uh, these fluvial channels were incising into these uh, fluvial deposits. <coughs> and so at the broadest sense, um, it seems that most of this upper portion of the fan, so this is sort of um, a geo geomorphic map, um, a more modern geomorphic map of the site, but where again, these contours are very close together, um, this region of the fan did tend to be um, 
seem to be dominated by debris flow deposits, whereas this lower fan where it had this sort of like orange stippling seemed to be deposited by fluvial processes. And so we wanted to get at the fan volume and I will explain why um, a little later on in the talk, but we use this model from Giles and others um, and estimate that the fan volume is likely about 0.04 uh, cubic kilometers. And then if we take the sort of volume of material from the upper fan, that translates into about 33% of the fan itself would be uh, debris flow deposits and another about 67% of the fan would be fluvial deposits. So um, kind of one take home message that we, we found in, in going to this site is that compared to earlier work, the both the surface processes and sedimentology seem to suggest that much of the fan was actually built by fluvial processes, not debris flows. Um, and this was exciting because it suggests that we can use some of our standard sediment transport equations to estimate fluxes and fan formation time scale, um, just because we don't have as good of theory for, for debris flow dominated systems as we do for these more standard uh, fluvial systems. <clears throat> Okay, so that leads us into sort of what are some of the typical flow discharges, grain sizes, and fluxes um, in this particular system, and how might that compare to some uh, temperate systems? So one of the things that we are really, really lucky um, happened is that when we first arrived at the field site, we observed a uh, sort of a mixed rain snow event. Um, so about 14 millimeters of rain and snow occurred over several hours in the evening of um, the 17th. So this is probably like the day after we got there. Um, and the max rate we estimate was about one to two millimeters per hour, which is actually similar to some of the melt rates that have been proposed for different regions of Mars uh, based on uh, modeling studies. And then while we were really close to, we were the very distal, our camp was at the very distal end of the fan, um, close to the, the Husky Channel, but up in the catchment itself, um, we observed snow that filled the gullies. And so what we did was basically as soon as it was safe to go out and do so, um, we went and we made measurements of um, runoff, or at least we documented the sort of active channel widths and depths and surface flow velocity. So in all of these um, locations down the fan where we have a star, we made these measurements. Uh, we also documented the type of bed forms that we observed, whether the flow was critical or subcritical, um, and whether active bed load was occurring. And there were three sites where we actually did observe active bed load. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all of the slopes that we used in our calculations were mostly were derived from the drone data, um, just because it was high resolution, so 25 centimeters per pixel. But in the few areas that we weren't able to cover with the drone, we used the um, two meter per pixel Arctic DEM. And then we did pebble counts. So those of you that have done those, um, super fun. You measure the intermediate axis of 100 random grains in the channel. Um, and from that, you can get median grain sizes, um, as well as this D84, uh, which we use in some of our sediment transport calculations, sort of as a metric for roughness. We also measured the bankful channel characteristics. So we surveyed. Um, most of these channels, and we estimated what the bankful um, flow depth and flow width would have been. Um, and so bankful is just basically if you have a very idealized channel that's a rectangle, um, it would be that the water is filled up to the brim. And if it fills up any more, it would spill out onto the floodplain. OK, so runoff. Um, we estimated runoff in two ways. So. For the case of where we actually were able to measure surface velocities, we use that to measure a you know, mean flow. And then we just multiplied the um, flow velocity times our measured width and depth to get discharge. For the case of the, the bankful case, we use the, um, this equation from Ferguson 2007. So it's a variable power flow resistance equation. Um, the nice thing about this is it takes into account uh, steeper uh, channel systems that have a lot of might have a lot of frictional losses due to bed forms and things like that. Um, and then we multiply the flow velocity times the bankful width and depth to get discharge. And then we just divide that by the upslope contributing area to get a runoff rate. And I said, and as I, I mentioned earlier, um, 
the, the reason we kind of want to get at runoff rates is just to, we want to compare this to some of the, the models that we have from Mars where people are trying to estimate um, melt rates or runoff rates um, from different climate scenarios. And so basically what we found is that from the storm itself, we had runoff rates of about 0.1 to 0.2 on the upper fan, um, and then ranging from about 0.01 to 0.08 on the lower fan. So, you know, an order of magnitude or so lower um, as you go down fan. And then being full runoff rate, we estimate would be between one and seven millimeters per hour um, on the upper, the most upper portion of the fan. And then throughout the majority of the rest of the fan, it'd be about 0.01 to 0.5 millimeters per hour. And these are pretty close to the range of um, catchment average runoff rates for Mars. So this is from a recent paper by Edwin Kite and others uh, who estimate that runoff rates on Mars would have been about you know, 0.1 to 10 millimeters per hour or so. Um, so we're, we're observing runoff rates that are similar um, to what might be predicted for um, a, you know, ancient Mars. Um, we observe grain size. So when we look at the full distribution uh, for grain size, we observe the typical sort of downslope finding that you would see in a alluvial system where um, the median grain size at the upper steeper portion of the fan was sort of coarse pebbles. Um, mid fan, you, we saw, you know, medium to fine grain pebbles. And then as you get towards the distal end of the fan, uh, you have more coarse, coarse sand. And um, I didn't plot, I should have done this, but if you plot sort of our grain size distributions uh, for our, some of our more distal sites, <coughs> uh, they're very similar to those that we observed, um, both that people collected uh, Becky Williams in the Atacama, but also similar to grain size distributions that have been estimated for the uh, an alluvial fan on Mars. This is from the Peace Vallis alluvial fan in Gale Crater. Okay, so getting at sediment flux, so how much sediment is coming down per time in, uh, in this, these particular events. So the way that we get at this is basically, um, if you have a particle that's in, uh, in water, um, there's kind of two forces we care about. There's the, basically the water is exerting sort of drag on this particle that wants to move it down slope, but then you, that's being opposed by the particle weight, um, which is sort of holding it down. There's a lot more nuance in that, but this is sort of the, the simplified version. Um, and so if you take sort of this ratio of the force of the flow relative to the particle weight, we get the, I think, every fluvial geomorphologist's favorite non-dimensional number, which is the Shields number. Um, and so basically, you know, we can calculate this Shields number or this tau star for a given flow condition. Now, when this uh, Shields number or this tau star exceeds some critical Shields number, where the critical is a threshold over which once that's reached, you start to move sediment, then sediment will move. So basically you take the ratio of tau star to tau star crit. If it's greater than one, then that suggests that sediment would be moving. Um, <laughs> so from all of our field measurements, we were able to calculate for both the storm event we observed as well as the bankful uh, event, what this tau star would be. And so we had to think about what we wanted to use for sort of estimating uh, our critical shield stress. And we used three different models. Um, one was from um, Mike Lamb and others in 2008, um, which is an empirical model based off of flume and field data. And here the critical shield stress is basically proportional to um, the local channel slope. We use a model from Wilcock and Crow, which takes into account the fact that if you add more sand to a gravel bed, it actually makes it easier to move that gravel. So we looked at this model, <coughs> and then we looked at a third model that came up more recently from um, Damien Schneider and others. And basically it has the same form as the um, LAM model, except for this data, the data set that they used here was mostly from actual field data from, from steep from steeper streams that had a lot of uh, macro roughness and bed forms. So we tested all three of these models. And basically what we found was if we look at this panel on the, on the right, um, is that the, the first, the LAM model, as well as the uh, Wilcox and Crow model, both over predicted. So they basically, both of those, those models predicted that we should get 
sediment transport or sediment motion at all of our sites, which we did not observe. We actually only observed it at three sites. So we observed it at site one, site two, where I had these white arrows, and site 14. Um, but the Schneider model basically predicted, did a pretty good job and, and sort of agreed that we should get sediment transport at sites one, two, and 14, but also predicted that we'd get uh, sediment motion at 15, uh, which we didn't observe. Now, we didn't have all of the like sediment traps and equipment to actually measure sediment fluxes. Um, so hopefully when we go up in the future, we can set that up and actually like compare sediment transport rates. Um, but we took this as a good sign that this model is actually doing pretty well for predicting when sediment would move at our site. And so <laughs> basically we use this model, the Schneider et al model to get at what sediment flux would be both for our, um, the storm event that we observed as well as for under, under, um, under bankful flow conditions. Um, and so this plot is basically just showing again this ratio where if it's greater than one, we'd predict sediment to move. Um, and typically almost all of these like classic sediment transport relations have this sort of form. Um, and on the, the y axis is this uh, Einstein number, which is basically a non dimensional sediment flux. Um, and so for the range of um, tau star to tau star crit that we estimated, uh, we estimate that the dimensionless sediment flux per unit width uh, would range from about basically negligible to 0.4 for our storm event. Um, <coughs> and for under bank full conditions would be about 10 to the minus six to five, and this would be under bank full conditions. Um, obviously that probably doesn't mean a lot to most of us. Um, so if we convert that into a dimension, dimensional flux, then we estimate that for our storm event that we would predict, again, negligible um, sediment transport rates to about 0.04 uh, cubic meters per hour during a storm, um, any, during our storm event, and then um, bankful sediment fluxes would be about 0.3 to 440 cubic meters per hour, <coughs> with an average around 70 uh, cubic meters per hour. Um, which seems like a lot of sediment, I know, but the bank full flow probably didn't, wouldn't last necessarily, you know, an entire hour. Um, so, so yeah, so we then actually, one of the, one of the things that we really wanted to get at with this data, besides sort of, un, besides getting at, can these runoff rates actually transport sediment? And it seems like they can, um, is that how intermittent this, these flow events would be, um, on this fan system. And this is a big thing in Mars. You know, we, we can kind of estimate the volume of a fan. We can apply a sediment transport relation to it, but we never know how intermittent the flows were. And so when you're making estimates then of how long it takes to deposit, um, you know, you know the volume, you know the kind of the transport rate, but we don't know like, was the fan active every day, all day for a thousand years, or was it active intermittently, maybe one day every year for a million years? Um, and so we estimated this for our, our particular fan. So we took the volume of the fan that was deposited by fluvial processes divided by the um, age of the fan, which we took to be uh, approximately 13,000 years. So that was the timing of the retreat of the, um, the Laurentide from this region. And we divided by our bank full um, sediment flux. And so we do that um, if we use a sediment flux of about 70 cubic meters per hour, and we assume that fan is about 13,000 years old, we find that the intermittency is about 0.2. So, you know, 20% of the time or so, this fan is actually active and potentially transporting sediment, assuming, or at least um, under sort of fluvial conditions. Um, and we compare this actually with a recent paper that came out. Um, looking at what the intermittency factors are for under a number of different climates. <clears throat> and this is both for fan and delta systems, but also for river systems. And um, basically for the, the sites that were looked at under cold and hyperarid conditions, are sort of falls in between um, in this sort of range of about, you know, point, I guess here it'd be about 0.5 or so. And so we got about 0.2. So the take home sort of from this portion is that basically that appreciable amounts of sediment can be moved uh, during a melt event that's comparable to melt, melt events on Mars in the past. Um, and if we assume that modern fluxes reflect fluxes over the last 13,000 years, 
then this fan um, was likely active about 20% of the year. And that would most likely be during the spring and summer melt um, or during, you know, probably in the spring and summer uh, before everything sort of freezes up again. Okay, so something else I wanted to like kind of throw in here because I was curious um, was basically how this fan compared to terrestrial alluvial rivers. And one of the reasons is that when you're doing remote sensing, especially on Mars, one of the things you can get at without having, you know, a topo map or, you know, if you just have an image of your fan is occasionally you can, if it's large enough, you could see the, the channel width. So that's a, a kind of a value we can measure from space. Um, and people have shown kind of again and again that the bank full channel width seems to scale nicely with discharge. <coughs> um, and so I was curious if, you know, these some of these relationships that we're using for Mars, which we do then scale for gravity, things like that, um, are relevant on alluvial fan systems as well. And so this data in blue is data that I, I collected during my postdoc with Mike Lamb. And this is all from very, this is from steeper river systems. So this tends to be from uh, channels that are, you know, slopes of 0.03 and higher. Um, and so you can see we get a, a fairly decent relationship between uh, channel bankful width and discharge. Um, and then plot in red are the data from the uh, Black Mountain fan. And it falls, you know, fairly nicely along this line, um, which is cool because that would be the easiest thing, right? If we could find relationships that we think we trust and that we could then apply measuring just channel width and not having to um, estimate things like channel depth, which often isn't preserved on Martian alluvial fans. And very, 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 very rarely, except for if you have a rover on the ground, do you get grain size and things like that. Um, the other thing that I was interested in looking at in this relationship is not as, you know, it's not as tight, obviously, is looking at how median grain size in these steeper river systems um, changes with slope. Because as I said, without having a rover on the ground or a geologist on the ground on Mars, you don't really have the ability to get at the grain size. Um, so if it were to scale with something like slope or channel width or something like that, that would be kind of nice. You can see that our fans typically have um, much finer grain sizes for a given slope than many of the um, steeper terrestrial rivers that were in this um, database. So discharge width relations uh, still hold for this particular Arctic fan channel, but grain sizes within the fluvial channel seem to be relatively finer um, compared to more temperate steep streams. And that kind of feeds into this last part. Um, so I think in the last five minutes, I think I'm good, um, is that are there any features within the geomorphology or sedimentology that are characteristic of icy processes? And so one of the things that was really cool to see um, are these shale boulders that would come down. So this is one that came down with the landslide that happened in 2016. Um, and I'm assuming it came down as a competent boulder. And over the last, you know, five, six years, it's starting to break down um, into these very like characteristic three to four millimeter uh, green sizes. And so we observe this both on the surface of the fan as well as within actual like deposits. So um, you can see this sort of shale class that's just shattering in place. Um, and I think when we were when we were doing our uh, pebble counts in the stream as well, there were times when you would go to pick up like your shale class to count it, and it would just crumble into hundreds of pieces um, of small shales. And so that process seems to be contributing to sort of this um, fining of the, the channel stream bed um, kind of locally. Um, the other thing that we were interested in looking at is um, basically one of the hypotheses for these sort of systems. So the, the few people that have worked on paraglacial fan systems have suggested that many times they are controlled by debris flow processes, but the debris flows are very limited in their scale because they can only be as thick as the active layer thickness on the hill slopes, or in our case, on the hill slopes or these talus slopes. And so if we use this um, sort of simple diffusional model from um, Bob Anderson and others, we can estimate basically from knowing what the um, mean surface temperature is, as well as the temperature amplitude, 
um, how thick we'd expect the active layer depth to be at our site. And so the active layer is just, you know, the seasonal, the thickness of ground where you get seasonal thaw um, before you get to like the, the permafrost table. And so for our site, we'd estimate that it would be, you know, around one to one and a half meters thick. Um, <coughs> And we did observe in the sedimentology, at least, that most of the debris flow deposits uh, that we mapped happened to be about, about one to two meters thick. That could be total coincidence, um, but it does suggest that there might be a possible uh, control on the size of these mass flow events that are coming down um, along, the, along the fan. And so that this, you know, the, potentially there's information in looking at the the size of or the, the amount of material that's coming down in these different events. Um, yeah, so I, I would say the take home message here is just that icy processes um, do seem to be important in controlling some of the sediment input um, to the system, um, as well as controlling the grain size that's entering the fan system and the sorting along the fan. Uh, within the actual sort of fan sedimentology itself, the signature of paraglacial processes was not super clear. So it didn't feel like I was really walking along a fan that was any different than maybe one that you would see in Death Valley, which was really um, interesting, um, you know, when we were out there to sort of feel like, oh, it's not that different than what we see in the Western US in terms of some of these deposits. Uh, so future work, um, this isn't a Mars really related follow up, but something I'm really excited about is that this site was really, really active. And like I said, it was so cool to go somewhere where like stuff was happening um, in real time. And so we basically are now going to sort of go back to this site to keep understanding it, but more from a terrestrial perspective of um, how do Arctic landscapes change over time under climate, um, under climate change or climate warming. Um, so we're going to be looking at sort of the rate of sediment production in that steep bedrock catchment. So looking at how um, frost cracking processes might control sediment supply to the hill slopes and to the fan. Um, spending more time looking not so much just on the fan, but on the hill slopes bordering the fan to look at um, whether the dominant mode of transport on these hill slopes is either um, slow and diffusive, so from solid fluxion, or if there's been an increase in landsliding um, or, or rapid mass wasting. And then doing more um, historical analysis of the fan to get at um, changes in rates of fan formation. So using more, you know, cosmogenic rate new glides, OSL, things like that to get at um, erosion and deposition rates. So hopefully in a few years, I can report back on some of that work. Uh, but the conclusions are basically that, you know, understanding climate and water. Um, if we want to understand climate and water that formed fans on Mars, I think it requires better terrestrial constraints. Um, and so I think that the clavic fan that we looked at could be a good analog for snowmelt fed fans. Um, or if we're thinking about cold and icy climate that's subject to transiently warm events. So sometimes on Mars, we talk about this where, you know, maybe it was very cold, and all of a sudden there's an impact that generated a lot of heat and created fluvial conditions for some amount of time. Um, and maybe the coolest take home for me was that these yearly hydrologic events on this fan that had similar melt rates suggested for Mars seemed to be capable of um, producing runoff and transporting um, appreciable amounts of sediment, um, both from fluvial processes, but also by this sort of episodic debris flow and, and landsliding. So, so that, that was cool to see. Um, and I think I will leave it at that, but I just uh, wanted to say thank you to uh, a number of people, um, probably most especially though to the Gwich'in tribe, who this is their private land, um, this is their ancestral hunting ground, and they were extremely generous, not only in helping us um, get permitting to do this work, but also a lot of people from the community actually came and, and would visit us and collect some of the data. We got them to do pebble counts. Um, and I, I really want to thank Sonny McDonald, who is our bear monitor. So he's a, a local Gwich'in guide and he basically kept us alive the whole time. So he was, he's definitely a, a key component to this project. Okay, so I think that's all I have. Um, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that really um, interesting talk. That was, yeah, that, was, that was super great, Marissa. Uh, Thank you very much. That was really very interesting. Um, and one of these days, I'll remember to turn off my mute button when I start, before I start talking and take this opportunity to uh, thank the speaker once again um, and uh, encourage everybody to come back next week when we will have another talk. Um, so again, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sorry that we can't take you out for tacos now, but um, <laughs> okay. one, of these, one of these days.